Jungian analyst Lisa Marciano. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap Radio. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm really delighted to be back with you. Yeah, well, I'm delighted to have you back. Uh, I say welcome back because um, you were here for episode number 624, Dream Analysis with Three Jungian Analysts. That was fun. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to say is is that we had fun. I, I know I certainly did. And now we're here to speak about your impending book, uh, which is titled Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself. And I say impending. Uh, it's not quite out yet. Is that right? It will be released on May 25th, 2021 from Sounds True. Okay. Okay. So uh, about a month from now. Mm-hmm. Well, well, how exciting. And uh, I really, I think as people listen to our interview here, they'll realize that they want to get this book. <laughs> well, it's, it's available for pre-order. So. <laughs> oh, oh, good. Yeah, <laughs> good. I'm glad you mentioned that. And, um, you know, probably seems obvious from the title motherhood, but I want to ask you anyway, who do you have in mind as your prime target for this book? What a great question. I'm glad you started off with that. It's definitely a book for mothers, uh, but it's for mothers really of any age. So it definitely speaks to the experience of mothers, of new mothers, women who are pregnant, women with small children. And of course, at that stage in our lives, we're often very interested in reading about motherhood and parenting. But the book also addresses itself to issues that come up later with older children or even with Mm -hmm. adult children, or maybe your children are grown and you're reflecting on your experience of motherhood. So um, it could be helpful, I think, for those women as well. Yeah. And what about for men? I mean, I, I think there's a lot here that uh, men could engage with, uh, if they're like me and they love fairy tales and uh, and besides uh, most of us have to live with women one way or another <laughs> it might do us good to uh, to know something about the depths well i have had several people who've read it tell me that they are going to recommend it to the men in their lives as well the truth is that it really is looking at motherhood as an opportunity for psychological growth. Mm -hmm. And some people have said, well, you know, is motherhood the only way you can grow psychologically? Of course not. I mean, I I think a lot of what I say about motherhood is also true of fatherhood. And really it's true for any endeavor that engages us deeply and demands a lot from us. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think it could be, it could be appreciated by an even broader audience as well, of course. Now, now, interestingly, that you end up writing a book on motherhood, because as a young girl, uh, as a young woman, you share with us that you kind of had a plan for your life, and you knew where it was going to go. And, uh, and you were not really primed to be a mother that wasn't on your on your plan but somehow somehow life happened uh <laughs> your unconscious had different plans for you than your conscious mind had well and isn't that often the way and that's one of the things that jung teaches us about is that our ego may have its agenda mm-hmm. but there's a deeper aspect of the psyche that Jung called the self that may have different plans for us. So yes, as a young woman, I thought I'm never going to have kids. I, I want to have this big career. And, you know, I, I actually felt disdain for women my age who had kids and then stayed home. I thought, oh, they're just wasting their lives. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, now, now look, you know, <laughs> well, that was very trendy at the time. I think that you were a young woman, right? But, you know, birth rates have been falling in this country, and there's a lot of dialogue around people choosing to be childless, which I respect. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think part of the point that I'm making in the book is that motherhood is incredibly valuable in terms of its opportunity for psychological growth on the part of the mother, so that motherhood really does make our life bigger. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And fatherhood too. And fatherhood fatherhood too, too, I might add. Definitely. And uh and you weren't on a Jungian track uh originally. You were you had some other career. I don't remember what it was. 
Yes, I did. Um, I worked in international humanitarian relief and development in my 20s. So I worked with refugees and I, I spent some time, I worked in Bosnia for a couple of years during wow. the Balkan Wars. And Yeah. And, and I think you were going to become a lawyer as well. I was going to become a lawyer. You have a good yeah. memory. Yeah. Well, <laughs> sometimes. Um, so um, there's so many wonderful Jungian tidbits, and I want to say acorns, because you refer to Hillman's acorn theory, and I've long embraced that theory myself, but I didn't know that Hillman was the source. Tell us about Hillman's acorn theory. Well, uh, Hillman makes this point that all of the information that is needed to make an oak tree is encoded in that little acorn. And he suggests that each of us comes into the world with our own version of that, that there's something that we come across the threshold into life needing to be or to become, that there's some kind of unfolding. And, you know, Hillman, I think, is the one that originated that metaphor, as far as I know. But you're, you're, you're right, Dave, that's an idea that really permeates a lot of wisdom traditions, is yeah. that we, I mean, mm -hmm. you can think about it as an inborn destiny. Right. Yeah, and just that there's this blueprint that in the unconscious that's going to unfold if the ground gets watered and there's sunlight and so on, and it doesn't, and the the, sh the shadow from the other trees doesn't uh, overwhelm it. You know, there's a, a there were a few places where I wanted to quote something, and I want to start off reading a quote that I think kind of. Uh, I had the impression when I read it, it was in the preface, and I thought, wow, this really foreshadows the book that's that's coming. So I'll go ahead and read that with your permission. Absolutely. Okay. So you write, the hero is one of the two fundamental archetypal patterns that each of us may live out over the course of our lives. The mother is the other one. While the hero is commonly associated with men and the mother with women, both sexes may be called to live out either pattern or both over the course of a lifetime. The fundamental aspects of the hero's journey are revealed through the numerous myths and tales in which a hero must venture out into unknown territory, conquer dragons and other challenges, and return with new wisdom. The mother's journey has likewise been elucidated in ancient and timeless tales. Her pattern here is, has much in common with that of the hero, but it differs in one vital way. Hers is not a journey out, but a journey down. Heroine stories usually involve a descent. And boom, that gets us into the book. And that really um, was important to me because I've been enamored of the hero's journey. And, uh, and that had a big impact on me personally and also in, in my teaching over the years. And I remember that there were female students who were kind of challenging it and saying, hey, I'm not sure this fits for me. And so what I admire about that paragraph is you have handled that whole ball of wax with great economy. Mm -hmm. You could have gone on and on about it, you know, but well, you wrote a book <laughs> about it. But in that paragraph, there's just this wonderful economy that I really appreciated. Mm -hmm. So you write that the mother's journey involves a descent. So tell us about the descent. We'll be talking about it a lot, but get yeah, us started well, with the descent. That's the through line of the book is this kind of metaphor of a descent down the well, uh, where we encounter strange things and then there's a return and that that kind of provides the organizational structure for the book but there are so many fairy tales and myths that follow this pattern of descent and return and uh, let's see probably one of the simplest ones just for the sake of economy again would be the Grimm's tale mother Hala, which i don't mention in the book or maybe just in passing but it's a it's a really um uh simple and but profound tale where there good. are two daughters and um there's the good daughter and the 
kind of obnoxious daughter and the good <laughs> daughter. So many like that. I know yeah. she either gets pushed or she falls down the well. Yeah. And when she's uh -huh. down there, she has to serve Mother Hala. And one of the things she has to do, she has to shake out other um, comforter. Uh, and 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 she spends some time down there. And finally, Mother Hala says, "Okay, you've you've done a good job here. You can go back home." And when she returns she um she is showered in gold and so she returns to her family situation with with the gold with this boon um and her stepmother her nasty stepmother wants you know her other daughter to go down too and the other daughter makes a mess of everything but we find out that when she was busy shaking the feather duster down in mother Hala's realm it was snowing above ground and so this tunes us into the fact that Mother Hala is actually a great nature goddess because she makes the snow come. You know, it's, it's an image of a primordial, um, very powerful nature goddess that turns up in these fairy tales. We see this in the myth of Inanna and Ereshkigal, this descent and return. That's a very profound myth of female initiation. Mm -hmm. It shows up in my personal favorite fairy tale of all time, which is Vasilisa the Beautiful, where she doesn't make a physical descent, but she descends into the uh, kind of the dark realm by going into the forest and apprenticing herself to Baba Yaga, this terrible cannibalistic witch. So there's a sense in all of these tales. And oh, and of course, um, the other well-known one would be uh, Demeter and Persephone. Persephone goes down to the underworld and then she returns. And that journey was the basis of the Eleusinian mysteries in the ancient world, these profound rites of renewal that would happen in Eleusis. Uh, so um, th this this mythologem of descent, especially for the woman, the heroine, just seems to run through so many important stories of female psychological development. And I think my point in the book is that being a mother involves a kind of descent, uh, both in little ways and in big. <laughs> yes, right, right. You do take us through that. And uh, I really love the fact that there are all these fairy tales. When I was a, a kid in school, the, the the readers that we were given had so, the sort of boring, it was probably beyond Dick and Jane, but other kinds of stories yeah. up front that you kind of had to get through. But in the back, it was, it was like they saved the, the fairy tales for dessert, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember skipping ahead, you know, because I wanted to read those fairy tales. And um, I think we all have a sense that, well, there's, these tales are meaningful or they wouldn't have been around for so long. And you kind of give us some guidance for how to approach them. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I don't know if I need to prime you more. <laughs> well, uh, fairy tales are very ancient. I mean, scholarship is now placing many of them at thousands of years old, wow. as far as I understand it. And, and of course, fairy tales are very important to Jungians because they're considered to be archetypal material. So that is kind of a product of the unconscious that they sort of show us uh, our psychic bones. Yeah. And, and, and that, that idea is kind of reinforced, I think, by the fact that so the, there are these fun, uh, the similarities that run through different stories from different times and places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just, you have to believe, wait a second, there's something going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and this takes us into Jung's idea of the collective unconscious, uh -huh. that these materials turn up independently, Jung would say, you know, in different cultures, you get very similar mythologems. And if you study comparative fairy tales, you know, there's a version, for example, of something like Cinderella in just about every culture. Now, is that because these stories get traded along trading routes and that kind of thing? I mean, I mean, probably, and, and there are probably scholars of folklore that could speak more to that, uh, better to that than I can. But um, I, I think we can't rule out the fact that these are just innately true patterns that the yes. psyche produces spontaneously in different times and places. And, and we recognize them. I mean, these are old stories, and yet 
we we recognize them even in the our so-called modern times mm-hmm. yeah you go like whoa that's kind of like my life in this way or that way yes. the the key thing that i was pulling for before is a point you make in the book is that and it's kind of like our work with with dreams every character in the story is the is you if if right. <laughs> it's an aspect of the single psyche and yeah i mean this is another reason why working with fairy tales is a good thing to do if you're interested in a depth psychological approach is it does prime you to work with dreams because like you're saying they're they're very very similar mm-hmm. so uh, you know for example um and it when you take that stance you read fairy tales in a much uh deeper more psychological way right away so i know that there are some feminist takes on fairy tales, which I usually grumble at a bit because I, I think that it, it, usually they're not psychological. For example, one of the stories I've talked about in the book is the Selkie bride. A Selkie yes. is a seal yeah. that can turn into a human woman usually. And in the Selkie bride, um, a small farmer manages to capture a Selkie when she's in human form. He has to seal her skin so she can't turn back into a seal and slip away. And he makes her his wife and they have a lovely family together. And but but in one version of the story that I rely on in the book, it says, her, you know, she was a wonderful mother, but her children never saw her smile. And then one day her youngest son says, you know, mother, why does dad keep an old seal skin tucked behind a brick? And she leans down and she gives him a hug and she goes and she finds the seal skin and she runs down to the water and slips it on and disappears. Oh. And and so one of the ways to read this story, and I think it's interesting to read it that way, and it has some legitimacy, it's a kind of an image of how women can be shackled in the institutions of uh, motherhood and marriage. So she had her freedom taken from her and, uh, you know, basically lived a a life of kind of servitude as it were. And and the second she could get her freedom back, she was gone. But another way to read it is that the small farmer, her husband is an aspect of her psyche. So she is very watery and uh, kind of, free in in the open ocean and he wants her to settle down and be a little bit more earthbound and that can be a tension within us sometimes Mm -hmm. we have a part of us that's very wild and free and wants to swim in the ocean open ocean and another part of us says you know i think i'd like to take out a mortgage or get a job (laughs) and and that's an important tension and there's benefits to both and how do those two parts of ourselves interrelate and how can they find a generative balance point yeah you you know you just said that as soon as she could she uh, went back to her freedom but the way i heard it as you described it was um if it's my impression is that her motherhood task was now completed. And so now she was free to go back. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I, uh-huh. I, I do think that something can happen to women as their children get ready to fly the coop, that we can go back to that earlier state of freedom. I think that's an interesting yeah. way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. Or find, you know, I think it's in your book, I can't take all the credit. Uh, <laughs> uh find a a way to reinvent oneself later Mm -hmm. in life Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well i'm glad you're i was going to ask you to tell some of these tales Mm -hmm. and uh so i'm glad you're open to doing that now one that you told that i highlighted here is the tale of two caskets but Mm -hmm. i can't remember if that's really similar to the it sounds similar to the holla story it is it is similar to the mother hollis story Uh where and it's that's kind of the the story that i use to frame the book and it's um you know there's a there's a trip down a well and then she has to serve the weird old woman at the bottom of the well and there's different kinds of tasks and then she gets to pick a casket she picks a very plain casket and comes up and it's filled with riches And then the second daughter comes down and makes a mess of it because she has the wrong attitude to the unconscious. So she's filled with arrogance. So this kind of ego attitude that doesn't recognize our reliance on the unconscious. And she picks a big showy casket and brings it up and um, 
think she's uh, burned to death or some horrible fate befalls her. I can never remember exactly which one, but it doesn't go well. Yeah, right, right. Um, another thing that uh, a recurring motif that you highlight that's in many of these tales is spinning and weaving. And you talk about the significance of those, uh, that they're two different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's spinning and weaving in the two caskets and that recurs in some other tales in the book. And spinning in particular is really interesting because it's associated with fate. So talking about the acorn that we were talking about a minute mm -hmm. ago, the sense of destiny and, uh, you know, destiny and fate, you know, are, are roughly synonymous, I think. So you know, the, in, in several different mythologies, the fates are um, pictured as uh, a group of three women who spin and they, they spin out the thread of life and they're responsible for cutting it. So that also comes up in uh, the, the fairy tale Briar Rose, which I tell, which is um, yeah. Sleeping Beauty. Yes. And, you know, Sleeping Beauty, you know, her, her parents try to save her from her fate, right? They want all of the spindles. It's been foretold she's going to prick her finger on a spindle on her 15th birthday. And so they banish all the spindles from the kingdom. But then, of course, on her 15th birthday, they go out and she's left alone in the castle and she's wandering around and she finds her way up to the tower. She's never been before. And there's one spindle in there. There's a spinning wheel and an old woman spinning. And she's fascinated and she asks if she can try. And of course she pricks her finger. And, you know, to me, this is an encounter with her fate. That's unavoidable. It's an encounter with her fate, this image of, of spinning. And it, it yeah. sets her on her journey, which involves the, a kind of descent into sleep for a long time. And, and then what is weaving? Weaving is associated with creation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so these are kind of profound mythological images. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, because the act of weaving, you're turning it into something, you're interacting with it. Right. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. And, you know, the sulky story, I seem to recall that, jo that Joan Baez sang a song and I'm sure she didn't write it, but about the silky oh. and I meant to look it up, but I didn't. You're not oh, familiar with no, it? No, I'm not. I'd like to okay. hear it, though. Okay, well, that will be an assignment for us separately. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. And everybody who's listening, because, uh, yeah. It's a beautiful I'm sure it's, pro it's probably an old story, Celtic song. It? Yeah. Mm. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, there's a lot of stories about Selkies. There are many different ones. And, of course, um, Clarissa Pincola Estes writes about that story and Women Who Run With the Wolves and... There was a film about it 20 or 30 years ago called The Secret of Rowan Inish. It's a really wonderful old film. Okay, I don't think I know that yeah. one. Another one that you tell is uh, The Swan Maidens. Give mm -hmm. us the overview of The Swan Maidens. Well, I contrast that a little bit with the Selkie story because they're both um, animal bride stories, uh, but they have very different endings. So whereas the Selkie finds her skin and goes back to the open oceans and her family never sees her again, the swan story starts a little differently. There's a hunter out at dusk and he sees, I think it's some number of swans, six, I think some number of swans come and land on the water. And then they all one by one get out of the water and shake off their feathery gowns and are beautiful women. And he notices that the the, the youngest one is the prettiest of all. And he um, is, has his wits about him and he steals her feathered gown. So then her sisters all turn back into swans and fly away, but he makes her his wife. One of the interesting things is in the Selkie story, as far as I'm aware of most versions, he, he doesn't pick a particular woman. He just grabs whichever skin he can grab and sort of mm -hmm. takes whichever one. Right away in the swan story, it's a little different. He's got his eye on one of them in particular. Okay. So they're married. They have a couple of kids. Everything's going well. And then one day the children are playing hide and seek and the daughter finds this feathered gown in the attic and asks her mother about it. And the mother leans down and says, tell your father that I am east of the sun and west of the moon and, and he must follow me if he is to find me again. And then she 
puts on the feathered gown and flies away. So again, there's this difference. First of all, we almost get the sense that she's compelled to do it now that she's found it. And she leaves directions on how she can be recovered. So there's uh, the, the husband goes through many trials to find her and eventually he does. And he says to the Swan King, he says, I'm married to your youngest daughter. And he says, well, you have to prove it. You know, how, how can you, can, can you identify her? She, you know, she's, I guess she, it's, it's this funny thing in the fairy tale because supposedly at this point, they're all swans. And, you know, one swan to us looks just like another swan. So how right. is he going to tell her apart? And what he does is he looks at her fingers and they've got, they're calloused from where she was darning, using a needle to darn her children's clothes. And he says, that's her. And, and then they're reunited and it's a really happy ending. So it's, it's like um, the transformation was complete. The initiation was complete. And there's this wonderful theme in there about how, um, how we're, we're marked in this very particular individual way by the toil that we expend on behalf of our children, so, that it's those little daily things that we do for our kids that we don't even think about that mark us and change us and make us unique individuals. We're differentiated. She's not just another yeah. swan. She has yeah. this individual identity um, partly through this this daily, very quotidian, ordinary mothering that she's done yeah. day after day after day. Yeah. So we're hearing about the, some possibilities of, of um, kind of getting stolen away, uh, become in, in, induced into some kind of servitude in a way, uh, being marked that motherhood will leave its marks and you've got a whole chapter on losing control. That's another aspect. Like we talked about, you had a conscious plan of where you were going to go and what you were going to do. And then, um, and I suppose this will be a good place to mention too, that, you know, if we ask, well, what changed your direction? You mentioned a couple of things. One was a series of dreams that you called your subway dreams. Mm -hmm. And the other was that you went through a severe depression. Mm -hmm. Tell us about those are kind of can be looked at, I guess, as calls to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. adventure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was the beginning of my initiatory process. I think I did have a, a real ego orientation. I graduated from college and I was going to go have this big career and I moved to Washington, D.C. and I was working for these nonprofits and working overseas. And then when I was 28, which is a, a, a very um, common time to go through something like this, I had no idea that was true. But if you're familiar with astrology, there's this idea of the Saturn return. And if you'd prefer not to think about it astrologically, we could just call it the age 30 transition you know, when I think as, as your twenties wind down and you begin to think, well, so what am I here? What, and what am I here to do? Um, and then it, it really hit me. And I, I did, I had just moved to New York and uh, to go to graduate school. And I almost immediately started having all of these subway dreams, which, you know, it's kind of unusual. Usually you move to a new place and it, it takes a little while for your psyche to catch up, but no, I was right down there in the subway. <laughs> And, and I, and I, I did, I got, I got, you know, I would say as depressed as I've ever been. And, uh, and then what, you know, kind of um, shifted that actually was finding this incredible book by Jungian analyst, Linda Leonard, to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude on many levels, including um, for this book, because if you've ever read any of Linda's books, and then you read my book, so. you'll say, You'll say, wow, it looks like uh, Lisa took a page from Linda's books. And I, I huh. did. I mean, her style of, you know, using fairy tales and uh, clinical vignettes and personal stories and films, I, I found that just so delicious to read. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and she really, you know, her, that, that kind of formula was really the inspiration for, for this book. And I'm indebted to her for that. And, and I, she also really introduced me to Jung's ideas and made them again, very rich, but very accessible. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think I wanted to do the same thing here. I think I wanted to introduce people to Jung's ideas. Maybe there's some people who are 
who are mothers who have children who are looking for a way to understand their experience more deeply, but perhaps don't know anything about analytical yeah. psychology. So yeah, it's, well, you definitely succeed at that, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And and when you look at the subway dreams, um, from a depth point of view, that suggests uh, something down. As yeah, you say, we were talking about the descent, right? That's under the earth. That's down mm -hmm. and depression. Also, we have all kinds of down imagery uh, in relation to to depression. Yes, people yeah. are feeling down. Yeah, and and really, it does actually feel. I always think about it like life energy goes in and down instead of going kind of out into the world. Yeah, that's that's one of the ways to think about depression is that the libido, the, the life energy kind of flows in. And yeah. Down. And so sort of our, our first impulse in our particular culture is to evaluate that negatively. Yes. But yes. the Jungian response is that it could be an opportunity to take it seriously and listen to that call and, and to go within. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I, I just sort of, I didn't even know how to engage it really, but I just sort of lived with it and put one foot in front of the other. And it did lead me to not go to law school and to go to social <laughs> work school instead and become an analyst. And, and, and then shortly after that to become a mother. Um, and imagine if I had just medicated that away, what a loss that would have been for me. Yeah. So not that there yeah, isn't a time point. and a place for medication, but, um, if we, if we can be with ourselves in those dark places, there may be treasure there. Yeah. You've got a chapter on losing control and I guess this depression certainly could be an example of losing control. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, also the, that can be a real fear you point out for, uh, for young women uh, who are not yet mothers uh, or young mothers who experience losing as this thing comes into their life and takes it over. Well, and even as we're a little bit older and we have older children, there can be a way that... Um, for some women, the early years feel really good because uh, especially sort of when I think of kind of managerial mothers who are very good at, you know, nap times and schedules and all this and play dates and that all goes swimmingly. And then the teen years come and talk about losing control. That can be a mm -hmm. real loss yeah. of control right. and it can, it can really um, put us in some pretty dark places yeah. So I think in that chapter, I mentioned two kind of case vignettes. Uh, uh, one, one, is, one is a mom who had an adult child who was struggling with alcoholism. And this mom had to learn to let go and kind of loosen her control over her daughter because the, the addiction had meant that she could continue to be in that role where she had control because she heard, but her daughter needed her. So her task was to give up control at that point. And just like the other, the other woman had a, a younger child, an adolescent who was beginning to go through those stages of adolescent kind of rebellion. And this mom had always been very attached to this child and this child's accomplishments. And this child was saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. And this, this mom had to realize that she couldn't control her child in that way. Yeah. And was thrown back into herself and had to look at some of her own wounds. Yeah. So it's like there are two kinds of losing control, losing control of my life that, you know, now I have to uh, take care of this baby or this child and I had other plans or losing control of the other. <laughs> this child is mine and, yeah. you know, and I'm going to control and, you know, all of this happening perhaps unconsciously. Um, yeah, so there's a lot that can be revealed. And I'm glad that you're mentioning uh, that there are case vignettes in the book, which is another enticement for people to, mm -hmm. to read it, I think. Mm -hmm. And also uh, life, examples from your own life, mm -hmm. which I always look for. And yeah. I, <laughs> 
Well, that's it makes it the, relatable. Where, yeah, exactly. That's where the juice of it is, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And another thing that you talk about that um, that has been on my mind lately, and I don't want to go into why, but it's got something to do. <laughs> so, okay, I'm not going to go into why. Okay. But the danger of mothers holding the child too close. Yes. And there are fairy tales about that. There are case, case histories. Do we have a fairy tale that comes to mind that illustrates well, that? Definitely Briar Rose is one of those. But the, the other fairy tale that I use in that chapter is this Japanese fairy tale called Princess Moonbeam. And uh, this childless couple in Japan find this beautiful baby and raise her and she you know, is the most beautiful woman ever because she's really the daughter of the moon mm -hmm. who has taken pity on this old couple and kind of lent this baby to them for some period of time, but she's eventually going to return to her moon mother. And uh, the emperor comes and says, wait a minute, <laughs> you're the most, you know, beautiful woman I've ever seen. You need to be my wife. And Princess Moonbeam says, sorry. And everyone says, you can't say that to the emperor. And the emperor tells his men to, to fire a shot at this descending shaft of moonlight that's coming down to reclaim Moonbeam. And they're all turned to stone. So there's this way that when, you know, the, the emperor and his men can be seen as an aspect of this parental attitude that uh, is seeking to control or to hang, hold fast to uh, a child perhaps that, that we really need to relinquish. We need to relinquish control. Yeah. And if we try too hard to hold on, if we hang on for dear life or we try to control, we kind of use our power like the emperor is, there's a way that our life gets turned to stone, that we stop growing. Not only do we keep our mm -hmm. children from growing, but we stop growing as well. In this time of COVID and homeschooling, um, all kinds of dynamics that can happen. And, and one would fit this pattern where uh, the, the homeschooling mother uh, finds that she really loves being in that role and it frees her from maybe other frightening things in the world. And she can really experience her competence and power here in this arena and want to keep it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that can uh, certainly be uh, something that happens that we can throw ourselves into mothering our children and not pay attention to other aspects of ourselves, and that it can become an arena for power. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um... So your book is divided into three parts and we've been talking basically about the first part which is titled down the well mm -hmm. and the second and third parts are well the second part is titled at the bottom so that raises the quote well i thought we were already down the well what's the difference between being down the well and at the bottom well there's the descent there's falling down the well and then there's the, what happens to you at the bottom of the well mm -hmm. And what happens at the bottom in these fairy tales and myths that I was mentioning earlier is there's always some kind of apprenticeship to the old woman, whether that's Baba Yaga the witch or Reshkigal, the queen of the dead, or Mother Hala, or the strange old woman in the two caskets. And it can, it's an image of, um, it's, a, it, it's an image perhaps of the self, of the the great mother with her uh, kind of ambivalence aspects. There's the positive mother and the negative mother. This is a, a very big, big kind of symbolic energy that we're dealing with here. And what this maps onto in the book is this experience of coming to face to face with one's shadow. So the shadow is a Jungian term. He coined this term to talk about those parts of ourselves we would rather not know. And boy, motherhood is really great at showing you <laughs> those aspects of yourself yeah, that you would rather yeah. not know. Yeah. I think those three chapters can be summed up best 
by this wonderful quote by Faye Weldon that I use. She said, the novelist Faye Weldon said, the best part about not having children is that you can go on thinking that you're a nice person. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. you will come in contact with some unsavory parts of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. As you, as you parent, you will yeah. get in touch with your ability for rage. <laughs> right. Right. And, and you'll find that you're not as nice as you thought you were. <laughs> But yeah, that can yeah. be really useful psychological information to have. Mm -hmm. I'm just going into my own experiences of <laughs> parenthood here as you're talking and remembering certain episodes. <laughs> yeah, I think we all have them. And I think yeah. it's, you know, we don't talk about it that much. You know, I read a lot of um, memoirs of motherhood, and I quote from many of them in the book, you know, but I was just sort of trying to read anything I could get my hands on about motherhood. And it's, it's pretty rare to speak very, very honestly about rage and parenting. I mean, either I'm one of the oh. relatively few women who would totally lose it on her kids occasionally, or it happens to most of us and we don't, we don't talk about it very much. And I think yeah. it's probably option number two. Yeah. So yeah. I, I tried to really lift that up. And I told my own story of really, really losing it on my daughter to the point where she, she actually vomited. She was so upset because I was screaming at her. So wow. there's, there's some shadow for you. Yeah. Yeah. And so I quote we, some other stories too. Yeah. We, we actually, we, uh, before this moment, we, really haven't touched on the fact that in fact, you became a mother. And um, yeah. <laughs> tell yes, us a bit more about that. At what point did that happen? And one thing that came up for me was wondering if you found yourself engaging in or thinking about engaging in some kind of self censorship in the writing, because uh, I experience a lot of that if I think about writing about certain things, what are going to be the implicate impact on family? Mm -hmm. um, well, let's see, you know, so I became a mother a little bit later, after I started. Um, well, after I, I knew that I wanted to become an analyst and had started that down that road. And, um, you know, it was, it was not something that, um, came over me and I felt really compelled. Like, I know I have to do this, but I, I think I felt ambivalent about it, even as I approached it, but it sort of felt like this was something that life was offering to me. And, and so I would embrace it. And, um, uh, I mean, when my daughter was born, I was just over the moon. It was just the greatest thing ever. Um, what I had a different experience when my, my son came along, having, having like a single baby is just so, well, for me, it was just so great. Having a toddler and a baby was, was just hard. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> I remember hearing someone somewhere saying having one child is a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, oh yeah. Um, but so did I engage in self censorship? You know, not really. Um, I, I, I do my best in the book to kind of protect my kids privacy. I do, I do have some stories about their most, I think, I think the person who winds up looking, you know, worst, worse is me. Um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty honest about the places where I think I really messed up and I wanted to do that because I, yeah. I wanted to, um, offer that, you know, as, as a gift, you know, to normalize it for other people. Um, but, you know, toward the, the, the end of the book, I told the story about my son's lead poisoning. And uh, that that's a terrible regret for me that I, you know, feel responsible for. So and I go into that in some in some depth. So I certainly didn't censor my own experience. I, I don't mention my children in the book by name. Um, and that that's at their request, yeah. actually. And but that makes sense to me. Yeah. So, so how um, old, are, how old, you have two kids? I two do. Children? I do. And how old are they now? They are 16 and 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're getting up there. <laughs> yeah, they are right there. Yeah. <coughs> Standing they're on getting their own up there. Two yes. legs. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, uh, and when you're talking about the shadow and you talk about the shadow, you talk about uh, projection, and um, a lot of us are familiar with those ideas. You, you also have a section on valuing darkness and also embodying darkness. Tell, you know, tell us about that part. Well, the, the um, valuing darkness is, um, I, I really kind of like that chapter because it deals with this idea of the positive shadow or sometimes referred to as the golden shadow. Jung once said, you know, the, the shadow is 99% pure gold. And the idea behind that is a lot of what we learn to be unacceptable as we're growing up, for example. You know, our, our parents through this process of socialization, parents and teachers, we learn this is acceptable and this is not acceptable. And so then we wind up, you know, repressing that would be the kind of uh, psychoanalytic name for that. We repress that stuff and that kind of becomes shadow. Well, we're not supposed to be bossy or we're not supposed to be selfish or we're not supposed to be grumpy or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of split those things off and, you know, one example might be, um, it's all very fine and well to, uh, you know, participate in the school play, but, um, you better get serious. Now you're going to be going to college soon and you can't, you're never going to make any money being an actor. So forget that. So you better study, you know, engineering or something. So then maybe, maybe that part of us that really love to act becomes in our, goes into the shadow. And what will often happen if we're lucky at midlife is some of this shadow content will come back and we'll be able to reclaim it. And we'll find that it has tons and tons of energy attached to it. But if we're parents, we may find that we wind up projecting positive shadow onto our children. And for this, I use this wonderful Norwegian fairy tale called Tatterhood and the Hobgoblins. And um, I'm just really, it's a rather involved tale. So I'll see if I can do it really quickly. It's a queen who's childless and she learns this sort of magic operation by which she can have kids. And she's only, there's these two flowers that grow up as a result of this thing. And she's only supposed to eat one, but she eats the first one and it's so good that she eats the second. The second's black. And so, she has two kids. One of them is this kind of perfect, beautiful, blonde, blooming little baby. And the second one pops out of her and is uh, riding around with a tattered cloak, holding a wooden spoon in her hand, riding on a goat. And the queen is so ashamed of her second daughter that she tries to lock her away. But it turns out you can't really separate these two sisters. They're just together everywhere. Well, one Christmas, there's a whole ruckus around the palace, and it turns out that the witches are attacking, and no one knows what to do except for Tatterhood, or I guess in some, in some cases, in some versions, it's witches, in other cases, it's goblins. But anyway, Tatter said, oh, leave it to me. And she, you know, runs around and vanquishes the attackers, because she, you know, the, the, Jung said the best way to deal with the darkness of others is to deal with it in yourself, Right. Tatterhood um, carries shadow for the queen. And so she, she knows how to deal with darkness. She's not afraid of it. And then she, you know, kind of rescues her sister and it goes on yeah. and I won't, I won't tell the rest of the tale right now, but, but it's this way that sometimes, um, and, and the story I use for this chapter is my own, you know, my son was, was a very um, confident brash little kid who would always kind of, uh, he was kind of fearless in social situations and he didn't mind taking up a lot of room when he, when he was a little kid. And that was something that was definitely in the shadow for me. It's like, Oh, you know, I can't, I can't take up too much space. I can't draw too much attention to myself, but he, he could, he was really, you know, one of those little kids that just would sort of go into any situation fearlessly. And usually it would really turn out well for him because of that. Um, so, you know, it would sort of horrify me that he was doing this, but then <laughs> yeah. it was, it was this kind of capacity in me that had been 
educated out of me that I could then come to meet in him and then reclaim a little bit for myself. Mm -hmm. It seems like fate sometimes gives us what we need, right? <laughs> If we're lucky, yeah. <laughs> the people it might not be what we, we want, but it will be <laughs> right. What we need. The, but the things that that are going to push our buttons, and uh, and uh, we might be required to grow in order to yes. to meet it. Yeah. yeah. And so, what about embodying darkness? Would you say that he was embodying it for you? Well, no. <laughs> embodying <laughs> okay. darkness is really the stuff about rage, and that's where I tell the story about screaming at my my daughter until she vomited, uh -huh. and and other stories of of maternal rage. Like I said, I was able to find a couple of really honest accounts of you know when I totally totally lost it on my kids and I yeah, share yeah. that and talk about it within an archetypal frame and 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 the difficulty of those emotions I mean this is this is dark stuff yeah it's yeah. you know and it's not good um but so what do we do with it that's kind of what I take up in that chapter uh -huh. well there's so much richness uh in the book and and it's, um, it's got the stuff that I look for, you know, when I'm reading uh, the thing that draws me to, uh, to Jungian books, to, to good ones, is that there are opportunities to reflect on my own journey, and I see aspects of my journey and, and stimulates new ways of thinking about it. And, uh, and your book meets all of those criteria for me. Oh, great including the other thing that we haven't mentioned is often uh, there are exercises at the end of chapters of various self-improvement books and so on. And sometimes I want to gag myself with a spoon, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I skip over those sections. I don't know if anybody does them or not, but uh, maybe I'm just jaded, you know, for having been in the field so long. Yeah. But you've got very thought provoking questions for self reflection, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, which I think are really good that it would be worthwhile somebody really sitting down and taking the time to, uh, to think about this particular fairy tale or that one, and just where in your life it might apply, etc. So uh, there's so much good to recommend this book. And uh, I'm, I'm really um, hoping that it does as well as it deserves to. Well, thank you so much. It makes me very happy to know that it's landed with you because yeah, certainly you're, so. you're a, a very good arbiter of these things. Well, thank you. So uh, as we wind down here, you've mentioned that it's coming out in a month. You said people can order it early. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you'd like to say that maybe we haven't touched on here? Well, um, maybe I'll just mention really briefly that the final section of the book has to do with some of the rewards of going through yes. this journey and yes. talk about a mature spirituality and renewed creativity and um, a real sense of personal authority. So um, it does end on an uplifting note. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and uh, let's see if you can you can go to my author website at lisamarciano.com and you can download an excerpt there. You can sign up for my newsletter. And also I have a free email course that has, um, you sign up and you get uh, an email uh, for three weeks, one, wow. one email per week that has, it has a fairy tale. It has a, a little reflection. Uh, you can listen to an audio version if you prefer. There's an illustration. Um, and that's, that's available, uh, on, Great. on my, on my website, which is, yeah, Lisa that's, that's very generous. I'm glad you had a chance to mention that. So Lisa Marciano, it's great to talk to you again and have this opportunity to hang out with you and, and to congratulate you on this wonderful book. I feel so privileged to, uh, you know, to have been able to spend time with it. No, oh, well, thank you so much. This was great.